Welcome to the future of pharma with ISP Boston where I talk to the thought leaders of the pharmaceutical industry about where our industry is headed and what you can do about it. I'm your host Samir Gondalia. Thanks for joining us today. Our guest today is Dr. Monica Weber, the founder and CEO of Fluid Screen, a startup company in Boston. A foodborne E. coli crisis in Europe in 2011 which resulted in 53 confirmed deaths among other casualties. While Monica was finishing her PhD spurred her to move forward with her lab on a chip technology. This technology uses electric forces to control bacteria motion in water to concentrate and identify bacteria in fluid samples. Her patented lab on a chip technology captures and identifies bacteria in 30 minutes with greater than 99% accuracy. Let's hear about Monica's journey and what it means for the future of pharma. Monica, thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to the future of pharma. Well, Samir, it's a pleasure to meet you in person today and thank you so much for the invitation and opportunity to have this discussion. I'm very excited about that. So am I. And I'm sure our listeners are excited too. My first question is about your TED talk that you did last year. I believe it was recorded here in Massachusetts, Natick. And to our listeners, if you haven't checked it out, check out Monica's TED talk. It's titled Replacing the Petri Dish with a Microchip. You can uh, look it up on YouTube on TED.com. It's a fascinating talk about her backstory, what drives her. But more importantly, you will also find out what makes her mm-hmm. father happy even though she did not fulfill one of uh, his biggest wish for her. Usually when I meet someone, mm-hmm. I ask question, if you were to give a TED talk, what would the subject be? But you already have given a TED talk. You are my first uh, TED speaker. Also, did you know you are one of the youngest scientific inventor speaker on TED circuit? Did I you? didn't know that. <laughs> oh, I, I looked it up, so that's why. So you are, mm-hmm. and you bring the average age of that subgroup way down. So, you know, good job there. Thank you. Uh, We'll talk about technology. What I do want to know is how did you end up giving the talk? How does the logistics work? Do people approach you? Do you apply for it? And what was your experience before, during and after the talk? So I got connected to the TED organization uh, to here to TEDx Natick through uh, one of my mentors who was also involved in the coaching process and was one of the main organizers of the event. So uh, he recommended that I come uh, to one of the uh, interview meetings and come and meet the group. And that was really a, a fantastic experience for me to come and talk to such an audience with such varied backgrounds and such interdisciplinary background as well. Uh, so I, I felt there was a very good chemistry in the room and lots of interest. And f- so is it when you say interview, is it like you give your talk for a couple of minutes, they ask questions and they find out if the topic is interesting or how, how does that work? Uh, yes. So the people who are involved in the uh, TED event themselves itself uh, they uh, already do the pre-screening so through my mentor we already did have a few conversations about uh, my background and what the TEDx potential TEDx talk would be about so he already gave me some coaching in terms of uh, from which parts of my story I would actually make uh, for a good concise 10 minute presentation and so then uh, then the interview was set up and that was the interview where there was a number of speakers already present and and I had to come with the first draft of the story, and that first draft was nothing like what ultimately became the, Just like the talk. Just like I'm, I'm sure. Pretty much shorter, th- uh, thankfully. <laughs> And I'm very grateful to all the mentors for the coaching they gave me. And that was both the coaching how to become a better speaker and how to make the story engaging. And to me, that was particularly fascinating how different people in the room, what was the uh, take home message from that first um, dry run? Okay. And also, so you get the feedback from them, what they liked, what they didn't like, or yes, definitely. And then they helped me uh, focus on the message to essentially make the story clear, so that uh, in in ten minutes uh, I was able to tell a story of essentially well number of years of of passion and interest, and also give some presentation about what Fluid Screen is doing. How about during and after? If I I'm not sure I should admit to that, (laughs) but I broke down in tears many times. (laughs) And it was... A lot of great speakers do, so you're not the only one. 
And I, so I'm very grateful for all the support um, all the coaches gave me and uh, really the, the, the focus on that. And after the TEDx talk, especially having all this publicity, both from the event itself and also from having the talk available um, on the internet, uh, we got lots of uh, positive feedback. And especially for people who come in and apply to join our team here at Fluid Screen, that was a really great opportunity for them to get to know the company prior to approaching us. Mm. So for us, we definitely got lots of attention from different uh, from different people with whom we probably otherwise wouldn't come in contact with. Right, absolutely. It also gives you lots of credibility. It's almost mm-hmm. like your business card. What? Uh, so to our listeners, it's a fascinating talk. Go check it out. Replacing the Petri dish uh, with a microchip by Monica Weber. YouTube, Ted, you'll be glad you did. About the technology itself, <laughs> the technology you have developed, it can detect bacteria, not only detect bacteria, it can only, te- only also tell you the type of bacteria in 30 minutes usually it takes two to four days so please tell us a little bit about the technology it's groundbreaking technology it's changing something that has been done for 140 years and it's completely different your background is electrical engineering and this is microbiology so i just find that fascinating the microchip we developed that replaces the petri dish it uh, has a, a system of microscopic channels each one of them has a system of electrodes and we apply a radio frequency electric field to the electrodes so that when we apply the fluid sample uh, to the microchip so the microchip uh, the user presses a button and then the system pumps the sample through the system of microscopic channels applies electric field and bacteria respond to electric field in the radio frequency range and that phenomenon is called a dielectrophoresis itself it has been known since 1960s mm-hmm. what we figured out at fluid screen how to do very well is how to control the dielectrophoresis force so that that more than 99% of bacteria that are present in the sample actually respond to okay. electric field and get captured. So is it the industry standard 99% or is it too good or are you trying to work out the bugs for the rest of 1% or 99% is way more than expected? Mm-hmm. When I first started working on, on dielectrophoresis, that was back in 2011 and I looked at the literature at the time and the state of the art at the time was separation efficiency of E. coli bacteria from blood about 30 percent. Oh, well, 99 percent is pretty good then. <laughs> so I believe uh, this is this improvement to be able to improve this capture efficiency to 99 percent for the first time uh, was good enough for high precision applications such as sterility testing in the pharmaceutical industry or potentially in the healthcare space. Hmm. And now we are way beyond 99 percent so we are very excited really? about that. Tell us about your early struggles, the technological mm-hmm. struggles, financial struggles to getting it off the ground. I'd say there were many challenges. So yeah, <laughs> definitely. So tell us about the uh, challenges mm-hmm. and how did you overcome them? Because I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. there are lots of entrepreneur students with mm-hmm. ideas or someone with a day job, but an idea who might want to explore it just to give them an idea of the kind of challenges you faced and mm-hmm. how did you overcome them? So I would say that definitely the biggest take home message for me was persistence, just stand up and go. (laughs) <laughs> and that that's usually my response to, to challenges. So w- what what was really a, a powerful experience for me personally, which then gave me the confidence to start a company coming fresh out of PhD research, was the opportunity. I'm very grateful to all my mentors at Yale University. That they they gave me a, a, an opportunity to pursue uh, this project and, and the support. It was really to come and notice that there is a an unmet need in the industry, and that was specifically the outbreak of bacterial infection with uh, E. coli back in Europe in 2011, where I realized that still in the 21st century, the state of the art is bacterial culture. Right. And I figured we could do something about it. So my fo- the focus of my research became very, I would say, different to traditional PhD paths, where normally in research you go and you focus deeper and deeper and deeper on a, on a problem. While my approach was I had a, an end goal in mind, very clearly defined, which was a solution to an industry unmet need, which we, the assumption was creating a, a microchip that will plug in directly to a smartphone uh, or another recorder and provide results in 30 minutes 
minutes and being able to test different sample types. So for me, the very beneficial process was going through identifying the problem, setting out assumptions, how the solution would look like, and then going through all the different stages of that, first doing simulations, lots of theoretical work to arrive at designs, then having these designs, setting out, designing experiments to validate these designs, then building a prototype. And that first process took three years. And that was uh, the research environment. And throughout that, and that was one of the challenges, I had to learn how to apply for funding and organize the funding. Yes, I was, you were writing your own grants, right? Oh, yes. I was um, I was very lucky and to, to be awarded five we grants. We just persistence. <laughs> we'll just replace the word lucky with persistence. Thank you. Too kind. And so, so that was the first part for me. Both this ex- early experience in the PhD research was first. Yes, I could obtain funding. I could identify and hire people, fellow students, to help me and work on these grants. And then also go through the entire process of creating a functional prototype from a concept. And at the company level, we just took it a step further and created a group of partners, some of the major companies in the industry that have been our partners from day one at Fluid Screen and providing feedback and guiding us towards what are really their needs and how we need to develop our product so that it will solve their problems and, and meet their expectations. Mm. So essentially the uh, early days at Fluid Screen up till today have been a continuation of process. How did you acquire funding for Fluid Screen? Did you go through VC? Do you have angel mm. investors? Or? Uh, we mostly have angel investors and we have nine angel investors right now. <laughs> angel investors. They are very supportive. Yeah, and yeah. I've you need faith. Yes, yeah. definitely. <laughs> I think uh, starting a company requires definitely lots of faith. <laughs> And uh, the investors we have, it's uh, these are wonderful people. Uh, all of them um, are very successful executives. So in addition to funding the company and allowing me to pursue my dreams, they also provided uh, support and coaching, mm. which especially for someone coming out of a research background, I think there are so many lessons to learn right. in the commercial world. So I'm very grateful for, the, for all the advice along the way. Elon Musk's take on mm. being entrepreneur is being an entrepreneur is like eating glass and staring into the abyss of death. Can you relate to that quote or do you think he's exaggerating? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that was so quick. <laughs> I, I think there are there are days and well, startup life is full of challenges. And uh, as you said, well, it's persistence that uh, gets it going and persistence also of the entire team. And we have a wonderful team and a very tight knit group. We work very well together and support each other. I think that's, that's critically, that's very important and definitely there, there are tough times in a startup and uh, eating glass yes i, I think definitely <laughs> <All right. laughs> right, so you, you get ex- acid reflex from yeah, that <laughs> okay. right, right. so it's not exaggerating <laughs> uh, definitely not <laughs> You just mentioned about Mm -hmm. your team. Tell us about your Mm -hmm. team. How many team members you have, your company size here, and where we are sitting right now in VDC, Mm -hmm. revenue, customers. Mm -hmm. What's the status Mm -hmm. of your fluid screen company right now? Well, you met Jacob. He's our... Not Jake director of business development so he's helping us uh, grow through the pilot projects we have completed with some of the major pharmaceutical companies and build a support group a multi-company study group to expand our deployment and early technology adoption across the industry and I'm not sure you had a chance to meet my colleague Uzma uh, so Uzma um, her background is in uh, microbiology immunology and public health uh, she comes to us with a uh, both PhD and background Background in research on malaria, and she also was a part of the Ebola response in Liberia and Sierra Leone. Oh. So she definitely does have experience both in deployment, in managing public health crisis, and managing crisis is a very important skill for a startup. Yes. <laughs> Not as big as an Ebola outbreak, of course. How many total mm-hmm. team members? Uh, we are a team of 10. Do you have any customers' revenue mm-hmm. or are you working towards it? We do have about $1.5 million in revenue oh, right really? now. Yeah. And we have partnerships with uh, some of the major pharmaceutical companies in the industry. And as of last month, we also have partnerships in the water testing space, in food and beverage and in cosmetics. You said pharmaceutical industry. Mm-hmm. So the application of any new technology in the pharma mm-hmm. industry is very mm-hmm. close to my heart. It's 
it's the name of our podcast, The Future of Pharma. Could you please tell us a little bit about the application of the technology in the pharma industry? We developed three different assays and we are currently in the process of validating them. Specifically, what they do is they accomplish three different goals. One is they provide information about bacterial viability, so the live bacterial count and dead bacterial count Mm -hmm. in less than 30 minutes. At the second assay... And you're trying to get that time to 10 minutes, right? Absolutely. That's your goal. Absolutely. We have four days to 10 minutes. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> 30 is outdated. <laughs> the second test we have, that's a test that replaces the classical standard bioburden test. So we are able to test both protein matrices and cellular matrices for presence of any kind of bacteria and specifically to help with sterility testing. And the third test is uh, for mycoplasma. So we are able to detect mycoplasma in close to real time and separate it from cells and protein. Do you have a fear? favorite failure like something when it happened it was very disappointing but in the hindsight it turned out to be a good thing we did have a project and it has a code name ayali 2 ayali 2 yes it's a short for ilium yes uh, so all of our projects have, have code names in house that's how we refer to them and yes, this good. in a co- in collaboration with our partners they gave us a major challenge of proving and developing new capabilities which are not available in the industry at the moment Mm -hmm. and we uh, did demonstrate that we can using our capabilities we can push the sensitivity and results which are obtainable using current methods so we can go way beyond what current methods offer this was a major challenge we had to develop a completely new assay in a record time and I'm very very proud of the entire team how everybody really stood up to the challenge and there were many (laughs) all-nighters Uh, pulled over and it was really very it was an amazing experience for me to see the devotion and the commitment of the entire team how everybody really worked together to accomplish this goal which at the very beginning seemed literally impossible but we made it (laughs) now as we were talking about earlier what you're trying to do is going in the field where they are doing certain things for last over 100 years the same way with slight modifications Mm -hmm. and you are completely going to change it Mm -hmm. it sounds very disruptive technology so if your idea and your company fluid screen become super successful who are the taxi companies to your uber so definitely what we will change and with automated testing at the point of testing will be the entire infrastructure of running tests so i suppose that will change the way laboratories operate and everybody with minimal training will be able to conduct these tests either at the point of testing point of uh, drug collection inside of a pharmaceutical factory or at the doctor's office or even at the convenience of your home. So that will change the dynamics of laboratory testing. I, I believe there is still an opportunity and value that laboratories can add, mm-hmm. but definitely these dynamics will be will be changed. What we also believe is that with an availability of, a, of tests which will be automated and easy to use, the total number of tests will increase because people will have easier access to information. So now they will find that they can use the information for other purposes. We haven't even talked about the consumer application of this thing. People can buy this thing at CVS, keep at home mm-hmm. and keep checking the mm-hmm. water and food quality, mm-hmm. right? Fo- uh, food for any bacteria infection, right? Absolutely. And our goal is, and we believe we have a potential for it, is creating a smart sensor that sits in a tank or inside of a pipe and monitors the situation 24 hours, seven oh. days a week, providing results automatically and wirelessly to a central database. So you can know about the contamination at the offset rather than waiting for 24 hours where there are billions of bacteria in there. And that's both for helping the industry control and respond to contamination when it happens and not just dealing with the mess of it after it happens. And also for, for consumers to provide them with healthier living safer living right, right. by knowing that the water they drink and the food they eat is actually safe from contamination because it's tested in real time. What is the size of this market? 1 billion, 5 billion, 10 billion? As of now, I'm sure we haven't even talked about the future application of this technology. Mm-hmm. If you license them, mm-hmm. there are lots of people who can license mm-hmm. this technology and come up with their own uses. Mm-hmm. But as of now, based on what you know, what's mm-hmm. the size of mm-hmm. the market? Um, from the estimates and some of the sources we have, we believe that the size of the 
pharmaceutical testing market, that's about $1.4 billion. And in terms of global markets, definitely including healthcare, including water testing, food testing, that's a rough figure of about $100 billion. What's FDA's take on this technology? Have you had a chance to interact with FDA or any other regulators? That's all ahead of us. <laughs> we have been uh, had the honor to be invited to give a talk at a seminar that NIST and FDA held in April uh, earlier this year. DC? Washington, DC? Yes, in DC, in, in near DC. And we had a we had a chance to give a talk, and that was in the new technology session. And uh, we had uh, lots of common uh, comments, both from from the industry. That was a seminar on a rapid microbial testing methods workshop, where there were representatives both of the FDA, of the of NIST, and pharmaceutical companies. And there were lots of um, very positive comments, lots of interest, and of course, lots of follow up right now. What does a typical day of a founder, CEO look like? Major activities. So the, the day at the office starts at nine uh, with with a team meeting. So we have R and D meeting. We call it the stand up meeting, where everybody essentially coordinates for the day. Then depends on the day. There are project related meetings, and either from the business side and major developments on um, our key partner accounts or meetings with uh, potential new partners and so technology introduction. Uh, some of them are investor meetings, either calls or meetings in person. So there, there's lots of travel <laughs> involved for sure. And uh, definitely, and uh, these are my colleagues that do all the experimental work. So <laughs> this was also a major change f- for me from doing the work myself to now uh, coordinating right. and, and, right. and supervising projects. And so we have a wonderful, very committed team. And we meet regularly for, for data reviews. And uh, for me, this is my favorite part of running the business are the brainstorming sessions with the team and just the creativity in the room and the analysis and getting into all the all the nuts and bolts of how things are happening and coming up with next steps and action plans and and making it happen that's that's for me the most exciting process which books have influenced mm-hmm. you the most I have one. Speaking of those which influenced me the most, that is a book uh, at the table by Bob Hammond, who is also a friend of mine. Mm. And he is one of the most accomplished bridge players, competitive bridge players in the US and in the world. And he wrote a book about his experiences Mm. and what is the difference between winning and losing. And his lessons were and examples were specifically from the bridge table and from bridge tournaments. However, I believe that they really are very, very relevant to the startup life as well and his philosophy is that when you play bridge uh, you encounter a a problem which you need to solve you have a certain amount of time to do that usually a few minutes and then no matter what the outcome is you move on to the next problem so you need to give your absolute best and full attention your a game at all times and be present in the present moment to actually have be on your a game to solve the problem and no matter what the outcome is if that's a positive outcome or if that's a a failure, you just stand up and go and you have your full attention when solving the next problem. Do you have any obsessions or hobbies that you explore during evenings and weekends? I love uh, taking walks around the Boston area, especially in the seaport area. And there is something calming about looking at water in the ocean. That's very relaxing for me. And I recently got into a hobby that's studying the origins of life. And I'm very excited about all the advancements in archaeology and in sequencing as well. And while they're looking at big data, data sets will reveal about the origins and human history. Is there a quote you live by or think of often? Well, if I have to, I would say stop whining and get to work. (laughs) What is your preferred way of Mm -hmm. if someone wants to get in touch with you? I'm on LinkedIn and also my email is monica at fluidscreen.com. Monica with a K and fluid screen one word. And that would probably be the preferred way. Any ask or parting words for our audience before we say goodbye? So what I wanted to mention is first, I wanted to thank all of our partners and people who support us and helping grow the company and also also how the early support and sometimes a, well, I call it leap of faith, not looking at the abyss, but a <laughs> leap of faith, how important that is at the early stages and early days of a startup to really enable the innovation to happen, where especially at the early days, there are often more questions than answers. But with the support of the right people, one can fill in the gaps and then make wonderful breakthrough discoveries happen. Well, Monica, thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you very much for your time and generosity. Wonderful. Thank you so much much for having me here, Samir.
hope you enjoyed today's episode be sure to subscribe and let others know word of mouth is our oxygen visit www.ispeboston.org for the comprehensive show notes from today's episode and also find out more ways to associate with us do let us know your thoughts in the comment section and if there is someone you'd like to see as a guest on this show thanks again for joining us today we'll see you next time